The goal of this meeting was to get the worldwide foremost experts and pioneers in neurology who are working at the forefront and the vanguards of the field, bringing innovation to the patient directly. So we wanted to bridge what is happening today and tomorrow in neurology and bring it directly to the patient to, uh, for the people who come and listen. So I think we have achieved that today, as you've seen with the participation of the people. And uh, foremost, uh, um, I think uh, we were able to get international speakers that are world class and bridge that difference between clinic, molecular biology, and advanced diagnosis and treatment. I think there are several important concepts when thinking about prostate cancer heterogeneity. The first is, is that there's significant differences in how individual patients with the same diagnosis of prostate cancer will respond to therapy, as well as their natural history trajectory, suggesting that there's a significant amount of heterogeneity in prostate cancer in terms of clinical outcomes. The second most, I think, important thing to consider is on, on an individual patient basis, and areas of multifocal disease in primary prostate cancer, there's often differences that are very meaningful from a biological perspective between and among the various foci. And I think a third thing to keep in mind is that among different foci of prostate cancer within a patient diagnosed with the disease, the patients with low-grade cancers, in other words, Gleason 6 cancers, tend to behave very similarly and are actually quite homogeneous across patients. However, they're quite heterogeneous when compared to higher-grade disease that again in the context of multifocal prostate cancer in a given patient, Gleason 6 cancers or low risk cancers are actually quite a bit different than the high risk cancers. have seen a paradigm shift in the treatment of metastatic kidney cancer. That was when the data from the 214 study were presented at ESMO in Madrid in September. And that was the first trial that showed that a combined immunotherapy consisting of nivolumab and ibilimumab is superior to the former standard of care sunitinib that was investigated in a patient population with intermediate and poor risk features. And that trial clearly showed an advantage with respect to response rates and overall survival. And also the response duration was quite impressive. I think this is the biggest breakthrough that we have seen since the advent of sunitinib. And it is also remarkable because never before in history uh, sunitinib has been beaten in a randomized phase 3 superiority trial. So we are going to expect a lot from immunotherapy combinations, either checkpoint inhibitors combined with, with each other or checkpoint inhibitors combined with tyrosine kinase inhibitors in the future. We have two new combination of treatments which prolong survival of years. That is first of all hormone treatment, castration with chemotherapy and castration with uh, the testosterone synthesis inhibitor abiraterone. These were overall four landmark studies which all showed a significant improvement not only in survival but also in time to progression in quality of life and in all other secondary endpoints that were uh, investigated. So that is the breakthrough in advanced prostate cancer. PET PSMA, PET uh, changed um, uh, the uh, view on, on prostate cancer worldwide because now we see prostate cancer and its metastasis. So even at very low PSA levels you can detect prostate cancer recurrence sites and then you can 
change from a systematic therapy or from local radiation therapy to a target or metastasis directed therapy. So this is a big game changer for the clinicians and the urologists appreciate actually that we have now such a highly specific and highly sensitive method for such, a, um, such an approach in prostate cancer. The Vienna concept is actually a little bit different maybe from some other sites because we start with a so-called dual biomarker concept. We take the best of all worlds and this is implemented in our newly founded Ludwig Boltzmann Institute and uh, so we take the liquid biopsies, molecular pathology and the imaging biomarkers all together um, to get a better diagnosis to change the treatment adapted to what we see in all these parameters. And so this is one column of the Vienna concept and of course we are going for clinical trials, real clinical trials in nuclear medicine so that we start imaging clinical trials and we are also about to start therapy clinical trials with PSMA directed therapies. And the third column uh, is that we have an approach with machine learning so all the parameters we get all together we just put it let's say in the computer, mix it up, get a new parametric image and so can classify uh, patients better in the future for uh, patient-directed therapy. Well, I think it's already having an impact because it's helping characterize our patients and it's both giving us information on uh, the likelihood of having cancer and then the likelihood of having aggressive cancer. And eventually it's going to also help target therapies. So we'll identify unique abnormalities in a particular patient and then we'll have a specific treatment that we'll use uh, for that patient, uh, uh, which is sort of a personalized approach to medicine. I think first of all we'll be able to better determine which patients need additional therapies because some patients won't need any additional treatment because they're unlikely to have metastatic disease. And so selection of patients for additional therapy is going to be probably a very important uh, uh, approach. The second thing we'll know is whether or not somebody will uh, have a response to a particular treatment. So. Uh, if you don't think a patient will uh, respond to chemotherapy, you won't give him chemotherapy, you'll give him a different type of treatment. And finally, you'll be able to you know, select which uh, targeted therapy might be best for that tumor and really only use uh, the therapy that's most appropriate. So the education is dramatically changing in the in next years because uh, it's going to change exponentially as as well as the technology is exponentially growing. So we can expect a lot of more standardization, a lot more widespreading of knowledge. Uh, we can really be positive about surgical training for the future. I can uh, choose three most important things. I would say uh, novel laser systems, which will uh, improve the quality and precision of intrarenal, intracorporeal lithotripsy. The second one is the, the problem of rest fragments after the treatment, so we will have new technologies allowing us to get rid of uh, rest fragments and get the patient completely stone free. And the third point are robotics. Robotic system allowing very precise, very, uh, uh, very good manipulation within the kidney for the treatment of renal stones.
2018 is going to be an exciting year, I think. A lot of things will happen in systemic therapies and uh, advanced uh, therapies. And uh, I think we will still keep that as a secret to keep you enticed to see what it will come. But we will inform you soon enough. Thank you.